passage starts the process of Jesus recruiting his disciples. Now, it occurred to me as I was going through this passage, suppose that Jesus had said, instead of simply going around the disciples' heads, might have been the Here is the crux. We have reviewed the resumes of your proposed leadership was found to be a bit of a dreamer, more of a follower than a leader, and maybe one who could jump the ship at critical moments, especially given his experience of the leadership of the John the Baptist community. The Rebedee brothers, James and John, were found to have the sort of ego and ambition to make the world we want them to be their top assistants, but we wonder whether they have the talent to match the ego, as well as the fact that the only previous job was the experience of being poor, was of operating a commercial fishing business, raising crow down, and the only major thing that had been in the public interest was the fact that the other people in our family were not in the Now that we've overcome our technical difficulties, we will resume the sermon. <laughs> As for the others that you have wanted to recruit, Nathaniel tends to be lazy, spending a lot of time under fig trees of the region. One Simon the Zealot has a police record as an anti-government agitator. Matthew, known as Levi, while establishing a solid career as an employee of the Roman Revenue Service, is also generally unpopular with people because of that career. And most of the others were so generally unknown that our background checks proved fruitless. However, 
There is one of your team members that shows definite promise, an educated scholar and proven leader with vast fiscal experience. We therefore recommend that Judas Iscariot be given a position of high standing in your organization, perhaps as financial advisor. Of all the Gospels, I, I enjoy the Gospel of Mark the most when it comes to the disciples of Jesus, simply because of all the humanity in that Gospel. They're such doofus heads. They make grandiose claims. they enjoying their status as close followers of Jesus. Maybe a little too much, perhaps. Peter, for example, is <coughs> called the rock on which I will build my church in one chapter. And then he's called Satan, as in get thee behind me, Satan, not more than two paragraphs later. However, in terms of my favorites, the Gospel of John, which this passage starts to cover that disciple selection, is my second. Primarily because of the story of Nathaniel, which comes on a little bit later, past our verses of today. Again, there is that matter of huma their humanity, the disciples' humanity. They remind me a lot of me in the mistakes that they make. And so they can give us insights and provide us with an opportunity to envision our connection with Jesus in the same way as normal human beings, trying to be bearers and, and carriers of the loving but supernatural God. Jesus, in beginning his ministry, did not go to the rich and powerful of Israel. He didn't go to the mighty folks of Rome. He didn't look for connections or political possibilities. Instead, most of his ministry was with the outcasts of Hebrew society. And there were quite a few number of those outcasts. In fact, historical scholars estimate that while he, most of Hebrew society were faithful followers of the Torah and regular visitors to the temple, only 10% of the people pass the muster of the temple in terms of being fully clean. 10%. The other 9% were rendered unclean by the standards of the day, and it was with this 90% of the people, called the Elohim, or common folk, that Jesus spent most of his time. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but rather those who are sick was something Jesus said at one point. I came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. The Christian faith is supposed to be made up of outcasts. Outcasts of people who have fallen short of the worldly standards of righteousness. We are all sinners fallen short of the glory of God, except by the power of God's grace. In fact, the whole point of the gospel. The whole point of the gospel is to teach us about grace. And that's why, I guess, I have such a difficult time with the attitudes of those Christians who would devote themselves to determining the moral standards by which everybody, especially everybody else, is supposed to live. Much as I would at times like to tell either p other people what they need to be doing and how they need to be living, I too am a sinner. And I'm not in the position to judge. I may be in a position at times to evaluate and suggest what it may be a healthy or healthier course of living. But I can't be the judge because I too, I too am judged. And it is because I am judged that I am eligible as a sinner for the power of grace. The old ways of the priests and of the Pharisees are not the ways of Jesus. Those who are healthy have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. If I'm righteous on my own, then I need have no need of the power of grace to make me whole. And if I have no need for grace, then I have no need for God. To be truly Christian is to truly to be outcast from the correctness of of the world, for it is in being outcast that Jesus was able to come and enter our souls and show us what God truly wants of us. God wants us 
to depend on God. To let the power of God's Spirit enter and direct the course of our lives. And in that directing and direction, to become one in that Spirit. To be a righteous Christian is a contradiction in terms. For we are outcasts, my brothers and sisters. We are Elohim. And in that aspect of being is just the way that God wants us. For it is in the recognition of our sin that we recognize our need for God's healing power. So in what ways are we outcasts? What are your favorite sins? I guess you don't have to tell me. Where do you have need for the healing of God? What happens as we begin to answer those questions is a couple of things. One, we open our souls to be healed in those recognitions. And two, we begin to have a story to tell to others about what Jesus has done for us, just as Alan was point, trying to point out in the young people's moments. We who have grown up in the life of the church should be best equipped to tell that story, but so often the opposite is the case. Having been immersed in the stories of Jesus, having been raised on such spiritual feeding, we sometimes don't stop to think about the effect of Jesus on our lives because Jesus, or at least the notion of Jesus, has always been there. We take Jesus for granted. And doing such makes us too much of the in crowd rather than the outcast crowd. But people who've encountered the living God in a new, new and dynamic and other ways, who come through a time of renewal or revival or healing or a time of meeting Jesus in the outcast cast dung, dung heaps of life, well, they've got a story to tell because they've got an outcast faith that helps them to know the depths from the depths of their souls who Jesus is for them. Can you answer the question, who is Jesus for you? and tell the story of how that came to be. Jesus tells us that the only way to experience life is in a renewed and renewing fashion. Old ways and old customs and old righteousness are like trying to put new wine into old wineskins. Do you know why, why the wineskin thingy doesn't work, by the way? Wine skins are made of leather. And when you put new wine into a wine skin, the fermentation process causes the wine skin to stretch and expand. And in the process of doing that, it thins and it weakens the leather. If you put new wine into an old wine skin that's already been stretched once before, the weakened leather will not be able to take the expansion process once again, and what you will have will be wasted wine because the wine will cause the old wine skin to explode. If we put our lives on the track of the same old faith, or if we depend on the comforting assurances that we've grown up with, if we aren't open to renewal, if we don't work our faith on the basis of being needful of newness of life, there is the risk of having the wine of our lives split and lake and be lost. Lost to complacency. From my point of view, outcast faith is the only way of faith. Let us work constantly and continually to grow and to be renewed and to let the Spirit's power transform us. And who knows? Maybe we, like those disciples who were first called by Jesus, will be so transformed so as to have the supernatural power of God dwell in our midst and have miracles happen and have our world changed by the good news that we proclaim and show and live. We have a story to tell, my brothers and sisters. Let's tell it. Amen.
just thinking, oh, I can use the microphone pack now. We pray your presence and God's presence in the midst of you. And this is a time of decision for each and every one of us. This is a time where, once again, we decide whether God comes into our hearts and our lives. It's also a time of invitation. If there are those that want to become part of this church family, we'd invite you to come forward during that time. Our song of invitation is, His Eye is on the Sparrow. If you're able, please stand and let's sing.